In 1956, in the jungle of eastern Ecuador, five American missionaries were killed by savage Indians. Less than three years later, the daughter of one of those missionaries was a playmate of those savages. The story of the five men, their killers, and how this little girl, who happens to be my daughter Valerie, came to be living among them, is a strange one. But it's true, and these pictures are true. My husband, Jim Elliott, was one of the five who died. Nate Saint, the missionary pilot, whose tiny plane was our lifeline, took pictures of the first friendly contact with the killers. Cornell Kappa recorded the story of death, and I took home movies of life in an Alka village. This is the story. The Republic of Ecuador, 3,000 air miles due south of New York City, is one of our friendly South American neighbor nations. Quito, its capital city, is just below the equator, 9,000 feet up in the Andes. This is where the story began. Here, where the conquistadores wrested an empire from the Incas back in the 16th century, Jim and I studied our Spanish, each of us living with an Ecuadorian family. Sometimes in our courting days, we walked through the markets or hiked on the slopes of Pichincha, one of the volcanoes that surround the city. Later on, we were married here. In fact, each of the five who were killed spent some time in Quito. They were Roger Udarian, Nate Saint, Pete Fleming, Ed McCulley, and Jim. They were all headed for the jungle to the east over the high range of the Andes and down into the Amazon rainforest. In order to get there, there was a limited choice of transportation. A commercial plane, which flew once a week, a mule train, which had no schedule, or a glorified station wagon known as a colectivo. When Jim and Pete made their first journey to the jungle, this was the means they chose. It can be quite bouncy, but the scenery can't be beat. The pass through the Andes crosses at about 12,000 feet, and then the road drops 10,000 feet in the next five or six hours, winding down through the gorge of the Pastasa River, one of the main tributaries of the Amazon. One can't even be sure there'll be a road all the way. What there is was built by the Shell Oil Company before they pulled out. Just a narrow shelf of rock in places, snaking along the sides of deep ravines. Several times a year, it's likely to disappear altogether. It's nothing unusual to find that a bridge has been washed out and a makeshift affair has been hurled across to serve until they can build a new one. You have to be an optimist to cross these bridges, but the Ecuadorian takes them casually. While this doesn't happen every trip, he's quite pleased when he finds himself safely across. Trucks are waiting for you on the other side of the breach. Somehow, everyone is packed in and off you go again, hoping the road goes through from here on. Sometimes there's a rock slide or a cave in from below and there's no bridge at all. Once, when I was traveling with Valerie, we had to cross a gaping ravine on a cable arrangement very much like this one. The operators were quite jovial about it. They waved me onto a sketchily built platform already loaded with gasoline drums. As they shoved me off into space, I realized the drums were empty and they began to roll. The wind was blowing a gale and the ropes didn't look too sturdy but we made it, as they usually manage to do. Shell Meta, once a base for the oil company, was the end of the first leg of our trip. 
It's a full day's journey by road from the capital, an hour or so by airplane. This is where Nate Saint had set up his base for missionary aviation. At one time or another, all of us jungle missionaries stayed with Nate and Marge Saint in their rustic and thoroughly functional house. What Nate and his airplane did to help change the lives of those who were stationed in remote outposts, only those who served before the age of flight can fully appreciate. Nate even devised ways of transporting aluminum sheets of roofing in a rack under his plane. In the jungle, where thatched palm is the standard, these provided a longer lasting and a cleaner roof. Marge managed to find time to take care of her three children and supply the jungle missionaries with everything from fresh beef and fruits to screens and nails. Whenever Nate took off with supplies, it was Marge who bought, stored, packed, weighed, and even helped Nate load them into the plane. She kept his ground log, knew his position in the air, and stood by at all times with shortwave radio. All of us found we had to do amateur medical work on our jungle stations. But we were thankful for the plane and the knowledge that in an emergency, a radio call would bring it in and a patient could be flown out to the doctor. A boy who had been badly bitten by a snake might have lost an arm if he couldn't have been given help in time. The friendly Kichwas, with whom Jim, Pete, and Ed worked, all knew Nate's little yellow plane and weren't afraid of it. They even begged for rides. Even some of the well-known tribe of head shrinkers called Hibaros had heard the words of the Lord Jesus from Raj and others, and some had come to believe. both tribes, there are Christians, Indians who have heard the story of Christ and believed it was for them. Some have learned to teach their own people. Others have even helped us translate parts of the Bible into their own difficult languages. very ingenious. He invented a sort of pod on the wing struts which would release a parachute with supplies. When Jim and I were just married, we opened a new station at a place called Puyupungu. For five months we had no airstrip and Nate dropped some of our supplies to us by parachute. Usually he had excellent aim, but of course the day we were able to take pictures, the chute landed in a thorny lemon tree. Jim managed to get it out all right. After a rather limited menu, mostly of rice and beans, those fresh vegetables tasted pretty special to us. When the airstrip at Puyupungu finally passed Nate's testing procedure and he made his first landing with us, we were as excited as the Indians. It gave us hopes of opening more stations, of getting around more often to visit the Indians. There was one group of Indians no one had ever visited and come out alive. They were the Aukas, feared even by neighboring Indian tribes. One day when Nate had flown into Arahuno, where Ed and Mary Lou lived, they decided to make another search. Everyone knew they were there, somewhere in the jungle. Aukas had killed a Quechua Indian near Ed's station only a few months before. The five fellows had talked and prayed a lot about reaching these people. 
but it seemed a very remote possibility until that day in September 1955. Ed and Nate were just about to turn around and fly for home when they saw the house. They didn't see any people, but there was no question about it. It was an Alka house. Long before this, Nate had devised an air-to-ground exchange by means of a bucket suspended on a long cord from the plane. He even dropped a telephone so we could talk back and forth with the plane. As the plane circled slowly in the air, the bucket dropped to the vortex of the cone. Don't ask how he figured it out. Aviation experts are still trying. This, the boys decided, was just what they would use to try and contact the Alcas. Years before, when the shell plane had dropped gifts, the Alcas thought they had fallen from the stomach of the plane because it had been wounded or frightened by the lances they had thrown. So it was important that the Indians see that the new visitors had the power to give or withhold the gift right up to the moment of delivery. For 15 weeks, they made regular flights over the village, dropping gifts free fall with streamers attached so the Indians could find them easily. When the boys began to make bucket drops, the Alcas even built a platform so they could get up nearer the plane. You can imagine the excitement when one day the Indians sent back a roasted monkey in the bucket. Subsequent flights brought feathers, combs, even a live parrot. Encouraged that the Alcas had accepted the gifts and returned offerings of their own, the men searched constantly for some clearing where the plane might land and they could carry out their mission of meeting the Alcas face to face. Each trip the men planned and prayed, and each trip contributed something to their meager store of knowledge as to the habits and attitude of these primitive people. Finally, the day came when they believed God's time had come for them to go and meet the Alcas. Nate had explored the Kuradai River and discovered a patch of beach on which he could land. They called it Palm Beach. It took Nate six round trips to get the men and their gear into that little sand strip. This is Nate's actual landing, photographed by Ed McCulley on January 2nd. They could not have imagined then how valuable this document was to become. Back at Shalmeta, Marge had regular contact with the party on the beach, taking down the messages in a code we had devised because we wanted to keep the operation quiet until the men had made the first successful contact. While so far they had seen no Alcas, they believed they were in the area, were probably watching their every move as the missionary party made camp on the beach. A shaft with ribbons was stuck in the ground so the Alcas would identify the men as those who had dropped gifts from the air. Jim had prefabricated a treehouse with his electric saw in Shandia. Nate had flown it in piece by piece and they worked all day getting it up so that they would have a defensible position in case of sudden attack. While Jim and the fellows were on the beach, I was at home in Shandia listening every chance I got to the radio messages between Palm Beach and Marge. Marge was indispensable. Whenever Nate was away, she knew where he was every hour. She knew how much gas he had on board. She'd run outside, take a look at the sky, and let him know just what kind of weather he could expect for landing. Without radio, the flying program would have been impossible. On Friday, January 6, 1956, after three days of waiting on the beach, three Alcas appeared. The fellows called the young man George. Of course, neither party understood the other, except for a few words that Jim had learned from an Alca girl who had left her tribe. George seemed completely at ease, loved our insect repellent, and even asked by signs for a ride in the airplane. The younger girl, promptly nicknamed Delilah, was fascinated with the texture of the plane, rubbing her body against the fabric and imitating with her hands, when she wasn't scratching, the plane's movement. Nate gave her a model, which puzzled her somewhat, but she was quite delighted with it. Because George had shown such interest in the plane, the fellows tried to explain visually how to build an airstrip, 
hoping the Alcas would get the idea. Then, with elaborate gestures, they demonstrated how the airstrip could be cleared in George's village. I'm afraid the message didn't get across. These films of that first and only friendly meeting with the Alcas were flown back to us next day for safekeeping. Then, Nate and Pete rejoined the others, all hoping for an invitation to visit the Alcas in their village. As you can see, they seem completely at ease, talking a blue streak in a language that has no relation to any language the men knew. And they seem so childlike and friendly. Then, late in the afternoon, they left. The men waited for them to return. On Sunday at noon, Nate radioed Marge. Looks like they'll be here for the afternoon service. Pray for us. This is the day. We'll contact you at 4.30. But at 4.30, there was only silence. These last pages of the diary I found on Palm Beach. I am Conor Kappa, a correspondent photographer. When the news of some difficulty concerning five missionaries in the Ecuadorian jungles was reported on the radio, Life magazine has asked me if I wanted to fly down and find out about the fate of these men. It took 24 hours from the center of New York City to Palm Beach, Ecuador. A helicopter manned by a naval rescue team pilot deposited me just as the rescue party was taking the last body to a common grave. The yellow missionary plane with the wings stripped, the bodies dragged out of the river. The atmosphere was fantastic. A storm came on with tropical suddenness, rain fell in buckets, dim figures moved through an eerie light. Grim and weary missionaries looked for the last time at their friends whose bodies they could barely identify. One of them said, it's better this way, I feel less miserable. Then followed our homeward trek through Alca territory. The canoes overloaded, leaked water at the slightest movement, and I sat like a protective mother hen huddling my cameras and film pouches. With hands on triggers and eyes nervously scanning the surrounding jungle, Major Nunberg led the party out of the danger area. At the missionary base at Shermira, five women were waiting for our return. Through radio communication, they knew that all was lost, but they wanted to be told in smallest detail everything that had happened. First, Major Nunberg told all he knew to Marge, while Olive and Barbara just stood around. Later, they have all gathered into Marge Sain's kitchen, and the rescue party's Dr. Johnston spared them nothing. Their faces were drawn and gaunt, but there were no complaints, no self-pity. I remember well the sad face of Stevie Saint hanging around the porch of their house. He did not quite comprehend what happened to his father and surely did not appreciate the irony of having the parrot for his only company at that moment, the parrot that was given to the missionaries by the Alcas. The memorial service, in its utter simplicity with not a tear dropped, while the five widows surrounded by their children sang, it is well with my soul. I flew back to New York carrying with me the pictures of Operation Aka taken by the late Nate Saint. Among them was the last strip of film developed out of his camera that had been fished out of the river. It showed the three Akas of this hitherto never photographed tribe. Nate Saint's camera, his notebook, his Bible, his wedding ring, and his recovered wristwatch that stopped at 10 minutes after three told the story and the end of a missionary life. But the hopes of finding out exactly what had occurred on the beach and why the seemingly friendly contact had turned into a massacre were dim indeed. 
The answer to that question lay buried deep in the jungle with the unreachable Alcas. For me, at least, the story seemed to have come to an end. I went back to Shandia, where Jim and I had lived, and continued to work with the Quichuas. People all over the world began to pray for the Alcas. I prayed too, but it seemed a faithless prayer at times. I asked God to open a door somehow, but I had no idea what to suggest. I asked him to send somebody in there, somebody who could tell them what the five men had wanted to tell them, that the God who made them actually cared about them, and that he was worth trusting. I told the Lord I was willing to go if he wanted me to, but that seemed absurd too. If five men had been killed, who would ever succeed? I knew that God could do it if he wanted to, and that was the reason for prayer. Prayer is not a vain thing. In November 1958, two Alka women came out of their tribe right into a Quechua village. I met them, and they came back to Shandia to live with me. Dayuma, the Alka girl who had given Jim some help on the language, had been with Rachel Saint, Nate's sister, for several years now, and Rachel had some valuable language data which she shared with me. I used this as a basis and began to study with Mintaka and Mangamo, the two who were with me. One day when the three got together, Dayuma, Mintaka, and Mangamo, they said, we're going home. The latter two had told Dayuma, your mother is still living. She wants you to come back. So they went, and Rachel and I waited for them. When they returned, they invited the three of us, including my little girl, Valerie, to go and live there. We had prayed for this. Others were praying for it, too. I thought of the words of Isaiah the prophet, For the Lord God will help me. Therefore shall I not be confounded. Therefore have I set my face like a flint, and I know that I shall not be ashamed. We knew that this was God's doing. We went. On October 6, 1958, two and a half years after the men were killed, with Valerie in a wooden chair which Fermin, a Quechua man, had made, we set out for Alka country. It took us three days by foot over jungle trails and streams, by canoe down the Curarai and up the Anyangu rivers, and then by foot again to the Tiwano. Here we came face to face with Alcas. The first one we saw was Delilah, Dayuma's younger sister, the very one who had been friendly to the five men on the Kurarai beach two days before they died. I had to keep reminding myself that these, these very people, were the ones who had killed the men. They were called one of the most savage tribes in the world. What made them savage? They were human beings. They laughed and played. They bathed. They showed no hostility to us. This man was one who had killed the fellows. And yet I learned they had their own strict ideas about right and wrong, even if they were different from ours. They believed it was wrong to kill people, except under certain conditions. Some of them said they thought the five men were cannibals. All outsiders were cannibals, in fact. And so, of course, if they were coming to eat the Alcas, the obvious thing to do, the noble and right thing to do, was to kill them. But now, Mintaka and Mankamo and Dayuma had succeeded in convincing them that there were outsiders who were quite all right, that these foreigners would come and live in the village and tell them stories about a man named Jesus. He was a good man. They should listen to these stories and learn to talk to Jesus. 
up to pray. So just as Mankamo had promised me months before, her people said, yes, let them come. We won't need to kill anymore. And so I took up life with the Algas. We decided that the best we could do was simply to live as much like them as we could, to share what they ate and the things they did. They were kind to Valerie and me. They gave Rachel a place to sleep in one of their shelters. They turned over a whole house, they called it a house, to Valerie and me. When the roof began to leak, they mended it for me. None of the houses was any more than a roof. There were no walls, no floors, no doors, and no privacy. The problem of communication was a constant one. I couldn't put together more than a sentence or two, and those were very short ones. Rachel and I never ceased trying to analyze and classify the language data, trying to reproduce it verbally with the proper intonations and nasalizations and all the other things which make a foreign language, and especially an unwritten language, difficult. Just try pronouncing a W with your tongue flat in the front of your mouth. They do it in a word like mene, and both the vowels are nasalized besides. Valerie had no trouble. She did better with a three-year-old's memory and mimicking ability than I did with all my language files, tape recorder, and systems of mnemonics. She showed them picture books and taught them how to hold a crayon and draw. This was the best kind of language study, the attempt to understand and to be understood. Manioc is to the jungle Indian what bread and potatoes are to us. He eats it at every meal. We learn to eat it too, along with whatever else they gave us, besides what the airplane dropped. I made a fool of myself trying to learn to make pottery as they did. I rolled the snakes of clay as smoothly as I could, but they just wouldn't go on symmetrically. I'm afraid I was just as awkward when it came to pairing manioc as deftly as they did. I never did get the hang of it. When the Indians would come into my house and examine my possessions, they'd ask, what's this? And then, who made it? Well, this was a stopper. You don't know who made it? Then how did you get it? In Alka, the same word for get also means take. So if I said I took it, they probably came to the conclusion that I stole it. The big day each week was the day the plane came. We didn't have an airstrip then, but the pilots were expert at buzzing the clearing at very low altitudes and throwing things so that they usually landed square in the middle. Of course, there were times in the beginning when we had to send out a search party for an item that didn't quite hit the mark. Rachel or I would get on the shortwave radio and talk to the pilot. Meat and mail were thrown out free fall, but things which might break were dropped by chute. We had a job convincing one of the Alka girls that it wasn't a good idea to go out there and try to catch what they dropped. A 15-pound bundle can hit the ground like a cannonball. They finally got the idea and usually stayed indoors as long as the plane was in sight. On Valerie's birthday, she even got a cake by parachute. It came complete with candles and Shell made his own special brand of ants. Obviously, they didn't bother her or the children who shared the cake with her. Some balloons came in the mail too so we had a real birthday party for the kids. These are some of Val's birthday guests. Note that they're wearing the proper suits. Their names are Biba, Tamanta, and Bai. Nearly all of the Alcas had acquired clothing within a few months after we arrived. Dayuma had learned to sew in the States and spent a lot of time making trousers and dresses and shirts. Some of the Alcas wore them regularly, others only when they were in the mood to act like foreigners.
I'm afraid we introduced a lot of new things for the Indians to puzzle over. Someone even gave us a hula hoop. They soon learned what scissors were for and wanted their hair cut. They had done this job before with a kind of sharp shell from the river. But why do it the hard way if Gikari, that's my Alka name, was willing to be the barber? The Alkas rarely counted above three, but Dayuma explained that one day in seven was God's day. And on that day, she was going to talk about him. Everyone was told to come and sit down and be quiet. She told them simple stories from the Old Testament or stories of Jesus from the New with her own illustrations and applications to Alka life. Dayuma told them that Jesus says we must not kill. So right away some of the men stopped making spears. But there were occasions when they needed to spear a wild pig. So, with careful explanation to us about what they were for, they made new ones. One even gave his spear as a gift to one of the pilots. But tell him not to kill any people with it, the man said to me. Tell him it's only for killing animals. Smaller animals and birds are killed with poison-tipped darts shot from a blowgun. The poison is made from the bark of a jungle vine, carefully scraped and cooked over a slow fire until it looks like chocolate syrup. They twist the tips of the darts in this and dry them by the fire. When they get ready to shoot, they take a tiny wad of cotton or kapok, spin it around the dart and insert the dart in the blowgun. It takes a powerful blast to send it up into the tree where the bird or the monkey is. But at 50 feet or so, they're quite deadly and they rarely miss. These men received us as their own relatives, shared what they killed in the hunt, mended our roofs for us, sat and talked by our fires. They were the same ones who killed Jim and Nate and Raj and Pete and Ed. They had their reasons. God had his for allowing it to happen. When five men had asked him to guide them and had trusted him for this guidance and protection, they had sung before they left home that last morning the hymn to the tune of Finlandia. We rest on thee, our shield and our defender. We go not forth alone against the foe, strong in thy strength, safe in thy keeping tender. We rest on thee, and in thy name we go. They succeeded not in converting the Alcas, not even in speaking to them of the name of Jesus, which the Alcas had never heard. The Indians could not have imagined the real reason for these white men being on that beach. They simply took them as a threat to their own way of life and speared them. But the men succeeded. They did the thing they had set out to do. They had obeyed God. They had taken literally his words. The world passeth away, and the lust thereof. But he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. This was the motivation, the will of God, obedience to the will. When I went to live with the Alcas, I couldn't do anything that a missionary ordinarily does. I couldn't preach or teach. I couldn't help them very much medically. I certainly had nothing to offer them socially. I couldn't even witness, as we usually define the word. Then I found a verse one day as I was reading in Isaiah. Ye are my witnesses, that ye might know and believe me, and understand that I am he. To be a witness is to know God. This was what I wanted to do, know him. And there's only one road to knowing him, obedience. Jesus said, if any man willeth to do his will, 
he shall know.